Okay, this is another video in the series for Math 1133 for UTSA. Today, we'll be talking about 12.2, the second derivative. So, uh, previously, the derivative was just the derivative, right? We have a f of x equals this, this degree 4 polynomial. So, I can go find f prime of x using the power rule. So, f prime of x equals 4x cubed minus 6x squared plus 10x plus 7, right? And we would usually just call this the derivative, but we can also call it the first derivative, okay? Which we alluded to in the previous video where we talked about the first derivative test. It might just seem like, oh, it's the first test using the, der the derivative. Well, it's the test that uses the first derivative, um, but now we have the second derivative. If I just find the derivative again, I get f double prime of x. So I get 12x squared minus 12x plus 10. Okay, and if I want, I can do it again. I can find the third derivative, f triple prime of x. So I get 24x minus 12. And if I want, I can keep this up. I can find the fourth derivative, fifth derivative, and so forth if I want to. So you might imagine that at a certain point, um, this prime notation starts to become a bit of a pain. So starting with the fourth derivative, um, if, if you need to do that, the, the notation is a little four like it's an exponent sort of in parentheses. And then x, and this would be 24 in this case. And then the fifth derivative, like a little five, sort of like it's an exponent in parentheses, and I would get zero, all right? And then the sixth derivative would also be zero. Um, there's other notation for this. We had previously referred to this as df dx. This is the derivative of the function f with respect to x. So if we find the second derivative, we're finding d dx of df dx. Okay. And the, the shorthand notation for this is d uh, squared, so to speak. It's not really an exponent numerically. It doesn't mean we're multiplying anything, but it, it's it's in the exponent position because I'm applying the derivative twice. So it looks like an exponent over dx squared. Um, and you might wonder, well, wait a minute. Why, why isn't this d squared? That's because dx is a single symbol, really. It's a single piece of mathematical notation. They're not separable. You can't say, oh, well, I, it's not d times x, it's just dx, okay? So it's it's a variable with, it, it's the name of a variable, essentially. This is something we've talked about a little bit before. So if I want the um, third derivative using this other notation, well, this would be d3f over dx3, like it's an exponent. And you can say, although technically inaccurate, I suppose, you could say d cubed f over dx cubed, that'd be fine. Um, only very rarely would we even need to bother with this. For the most part in this course, um, the second derivative is kind of where we stop needing derivatives. Um, for, if you're taking this class, then you're not going to need the third, fourth, fifth, so forth derivative later in a different class. Um, so for example, in the College of Business, stats majors would need that, but they take Cal 1 and Cal 2. They don't take um, 1133 necessarily, unless, I mean, they could, but they typically, typically take Cal 1 and Cal 2. Anyway, that's basically just the notation we're going to be, the concept and notation that we're going to be using. So the next thing is just an application of why would we care about this? What's, what's, the, what's the meaning of it? What can we do with this? So our first example will be comparing two stock price models. Let's say stock A is modeled by the function f of x equals, the, uh, equals x to the one half power plus five. I was about to say the square root of x, which I could rewrite it that way. But since we're doing derivatives, I don't want to use the power rule. Um, I, I haven't written it as the square root of x. Um, and then stock B is modeled by g of x equals 0 0.1 times uh, x to the 3 halves power plus 5. And you could ask, okay, well, which stock is going to be a better investment? Which one's going to grow the most, right? And let's say that, um, let's say that x equals 0 um, corresponds to right now. Okay. You could ask, well, which of these stocks is going up? Right, which which was increasing. And we can essentially apply the increase and decrease in test we, we had talked about before. So I could look at uh, for stock, well I could ask that I could ask it this way. Increasing question mark. Which of these is increasing? 
So for stock A, well, we'll look at the derivative to see where this is increasing. So f prime of x, this equals uh, 1 half x to the negative 1 half power plus 0, but I don't need to write plus 0. And then stock B, well, g prime of x, this will be, uh, well, uh, point 0.1 is 1 out of 10, if I want to think of it as being a fraction. So 3 halves times 1 out of 10 would be 3 out of 20. x to the 1 half power. I could have a decimal if I wanted. I guess that would be 0.15, but I'll leave it as a fraction. Again, plus 0. I don't need to write that. And then each of these could be written with a root instead of um, an exponent. There's a, a reason to do this that will maybe become obvious in a moment. Okay, so looking at this, if we're thinking about going into the future, 1 over the square root of, I'm sorry, 1 over 2 times the square root of x, well, that's always positive, right? No matter what you pick, because now 0 counts as now. And then let's say maybe it goes by months or something. So 1 would be a month from now, 2 would be a month later, 3 would be a month after that. No matter what you pick, this is always positive, right? But so is this one. So this one is always increasing in the future. But this one is too. So that doesn't really tell you which one is going to be better, which one's going to make you the most return, because they, well, yeah, they both go up. They both increase. Yeah, well, which one increases more, right? Which one is going to keep increasing or increase the fastest, right? So basically, the second derivative tells you which one increases the fastest. So um, let's say, um, is this fast or slow? The, the increase. Okay, so for, for stock A, I look at the second derivative, f double prime of x. And I'm going to be looking at the um, exponent version, not the radical version, because I, I would have to convert this back into an exponent to apply the power rule anyway. So this equals negative uh, 1 fourth x to the negative 3 halves power. Hey, this, is, this has a negative, right? This is a negative quantity. If I want to rewrite this um, using a root, I guess if I if I want to bother, I could do negative 1 over uh, 4x root x if I wanted to do that. Uh, yeah, this is negative no matter what you pick. So this increases more slowly over time. It is increasing, but at a diminishing rate. Over time, the increase slows down. For b, uh, this will be g double prime of x. And again, I'm looking at this one. So this will be 3 over 40 x to the negative 1 half power, which if I rewrite as a radical instead of a exponent, I'll get 3 over 40 times the square root of x. Hey, this is positive. This speeds up over time. Okay. And in fact, if you graph these out, they'll look like the following. Let's say here's um here's our x-axis, which is basically time. Our vertical would be in the value of the stock, right? They're both going to start off at um say uh, five, right? The value would be five starting because if you plug zero in there, you get five as a result. So the first stock will do like this. It will actually increase rather rapidly at the beginning. And it'll kind of slow down, taper off as time goes on. The other one will be slower at the beginning, but it will increase over time. So this was stock A. This was stock B. So for a short-term investment, maybe this one's better because it, it's increasing more at the beginning. But for a long-term investment, this one's better because it increases more later. It speeds up over time. And knowing which one is which might be really useful. You know, which one should I invest in for short versus long period uh, time? And we could say that, in fact, the place where they um they cross here, right? If you, let's say, I don't know, let's say this is, I don't know, 10, just to make up a number, right? If, if you were going to invest for exactly 10 months, right? You want to earn some, some return, but you knew it was 10 months, then it wouldn't matter which one you put your money into because they would they would equal the same amount or they would be valued at the same amount at some point. Um, you know, I'm sorry, at 10 months, right? 
in early on, you would say, oh, well, here, uh, A is better. Less than 10 months. And then B is better after 10 months. Okay. Anyway. This is um, a copy of a graph that we looked at previously, and we use this to talk about um, increasing versus decreasing with respect to the, the first derivative. So I want to look at these numbers here. I want to look at um, these slope values. Remember, the, the slope is the derivative, right? The derivative is the slope. And as we go along, the the slope decreases 110 3 1 0 negative 1 negative 5 negative 6. so this hill shape is associated with the slope decreasing from left to right so when the slope decreases that corresponds to the second derivative being negative okay so just like with this one here the slope decreases over time it gets flatter. That's because the second derivative was negative, right? So here, I'm going to say that this corresponds with f. Hmm. Switch to a smaller stylus there. f double prime is negative there. Okay. Now, if we look, we didn't, well, yeah, we marked enough of these. If I then continue to look, let me change colors here. Uh, negative 6, negative 5, negative 3, negative 1, 0, 1. And if we move further along, we could say, oh, maybe um, this is a, maybe this is about 3, and this is maybe about 4, something like that, right? The slope is increasing as we move along with the function, negative 6, negative 5, negative 3, negative 1, 0, 1, 3, 4. That is associated with... Um, the second derivative being positive, just like up here on this graph, stock B, the slope increases as you go along. It gets steeper as you go along. That's because the second derivative is positive. Okay. So I'm going to change the highlighting here. Um, yeah, I'll get rid of all of, all of the highlighting. To emphasize not increasing decreasing which the blue and the red are currently emphasizing but to in emphasize the concavity which i guess we haven't had that term yet concavity describes whether something um, curves down overall is hill shaped or curves up overall is sort of valley shaped okay good enough so let's say um curving down is green that's uh, or purple rather purple is what i was using so this here, this is all concave down because the derivative, rather the second derivative is negative. Concave down, I'll abbreviate it. In fact, let's, you know what? Let's not abbreviate all of them. I'll abbreviate some of them, but let's do concave down is this whole purple section. And then concave up would be um, this section where the second derivative is positive. Okay, so again, over here, from about here to about, um, I guess there, the, um, oh, you know what, let's give her that too. The um, second derivative is negative, and this is because this is concave down, over here, The second derivative is positive because this is concave up. And then here, the second derivative is negative because this is concave down again. Okay. Um, and then a straight line section like this doesn't have concavity per se. Um, here, the second derivative is zero for a straight line. If you think about it, um, the slope doesn't change, right? From You move from one point to the next. All of these, the slope is about negative 1. So if the slope is not changing, it's not increasing or decreasing, well, then the concavity 
would be zero. The second derivative would be zero. So yeah, basically we can associate the derivative with the concavity. And notice both of these purple sections, these have high points, right? And both of these green sections, these have low points, okay? Um, over here, this purple section and gray section, I guess, it's sort of split, um, has a low point. Um, and that th these will become relevant uh, in the next few examples. Um, this one will, will come up a little bit later. Okay, so what's next? So this example says, find the intervals in which f of x equals x cubed minus x is concave up slash down. So basically, this is a little bit like um, looking for uh, intervals in which the function is increasing and decreasing, which we did with the first derivative. But this, this we use the second derivative. So step one, I'm going to find um, the first derivative because I, I have to do that to find the second derivative. So f prime of x equals 3x squared minus 1. And then f double prime of x, this equals 6x. Okay. So again, I want to look for, oh, you know, I forgot something. This point right here, where the concavity switches, this is called an inflection point or, or point of inflection. Okay. And likewise uh, here. Inflection point. And also there. Um, uh, this point here is also an inflection point. Now, this one is not technically an inflection point because an inflection point is where the concavity switches from one type to the other, concave down to concave up or, or the other way around. The con concavity on the left is um, neither. It's you know zero. On, um, flat, I guess you could say. So this corner is not technically um, an inflection point because the concavity does not switch. But if the concavity switches from up to down, that's an inflection point. Okay. So basically, what I want to do is look for the places where concavity might switch. And this would be, well, wherever the second derivative is zero or undefined, I might get a switch in concavity. All right. So step two, uh, we're going to in, in the increasing decreasing test in the previous video, we would talk about looking for critical numbers. Well, the and you would look for where the first derivative is undefined or zero. Here, these numbers we're going to find are not named anything. Um, it would be it would kind of make sense to call them inflection numbers. That would kind of make sense, but they're not technically named. Books don't give them a name. So we're finding the things that are analogous to critical numbers. Okay, so we're first going to look for where is the second derivative undefined. And since this is just a linear function, the answer is nowhere. So this is the same consideration we would make looking for critical numbers. What is the domain here? Is there anything that is um, not included in the domain? And in this case, no. So then we'll look for where is the second derivative uh, equal to 0. So I'll solve this equation. Easy one. Just divide by 6 on both sides. So there is where we might have a change in the concavity. Maybe. So step 3, I'll make my number line. And as with um, the first derivative test and the increase and decreasing test, this is not essential, um, but I think it helps to organize information. So I'm going to mark with a little i for inflection. This is where I might get an inflection point, possibly. Okay. So I'll pick a number on the left, say negative 1, number on the right, say positive 1, and I'm checking the second derivative there to see what kind of concavity I have. So 6 times negative 1, of course, is negative. So I'm going to draw like a little down opening parabola to indicate to me later, oh, that, that's concave down. And then, oh, we're almost out of room here. Uh, F double prime of 1. And in fact, um, yeah, I think, yeah, let's do that. So I have a bit more room. So this will be uh, 6 times 1, which is positive, of course, and I'll indicate that for myself here. So then I can conclude that um, the function is concave down 
on the interval from negative infinity up to zero, and then concave up from zero to infinity. So I've gotten information about the shape of the graph using the second derivative. Okay, what's next? Well, here we go, concave, concavity test. It's just a summarization of what we just did. So given some function f, uh, you'll find the first and second derivatives, find both. Find the x values where f prime of x is zero or undefined. Evaluate the second derivative at a test value from each interval. And then a positive second derivative means concave up, negative second derivative means concave down. So it's essentially what we, what we just did. Okay, so this concept, the point of diminishing returns. What this is about is where a function um, that is increasing slows its increase. So let me do a visual example. Let's um, find an empty spot. Yeah, let's put it here. This little bit of empty spot here. If I had something like the following. Okay, let's say this is like revenue or profit or something. And the value increases and then it starts to flatten. Okay, this point right here, this is called the point of diminishing returns. And the reason it's called that is the following. Um, this point here and this point here, let's say this is a revenue function. Let's say X is some input, R is the revenue. Maybe it's time, maybe it's number of employees, whatever it is. The derivative here at this point is less than the derivative here at this point, right? It's less steep. And so if you want to increase um, your your revenue more, you should you should increase whatever that input is to move from the first point to the second point because you, you're getting more increase. And then as long as this is less than the next one, you should increase your input more to get to the next one. Over here, this um, derivative, the slope, is greater than this one. Okay, So really, if you're here, maybe you ought to be back here. And basically what this means is that the if we think about X as being like maybe dollars spent on advertising and R is overall revenue, at this point, your revenue dollars are not getting you as much benefit per dollar as at this point. So you're spending more on advertising, for example, and you're getting more revenue, but your, your benefit per dollar input is not as high on that right-hand point. So maybe it's, it'd be better to be at that left-hand point. And by left-hand, I mean... Uh, that one there. So this point here represents sort of an optimal location where this is the steepest location. So basically, R prime is at a maximum. And for a number of different applications where maybe you are putting... Um, money into different funds or different departments and you have a lot of leeway in how you divvy that up you know like you have a big pool of money and you have to decide among like 12 different inputs where to put it well wouldn't you want to know for each of those different inputs what's the, the what, what's the most efficient spot to be and you can kind of allocate money that way and then if, then if there's extra say well let's give everything 10 percent more than we had planned i've optimized everything to be the most efficient in return per dollar but we, we have dollars left over, so let's go ahead and spend them. But you could start as a baseline. What would be the, the steepest spot on the benefit curve for these inputs, right? And the way to calculate that is this is an inflection point, okay? So down here, this example says, okay, here, find the point of diminishing returns of this function. So um, this is a function I got from a textbook at some point. I'm pretty sure um, I didn't change the numbers. So this is from a textbook. And basically, the um, R of X is the revenue as a num as a function of the number of seat miles for some airline, or maybe it's a whole airline industry. I think it was, I think it was an individual company though. So X is the number of seat miles in hundreds of billions, and then R is billions of US dollars. Well, what's a seat mile? Well, a seat mile is basically where, uh, say you have an airplane uh, with 100 seats and it flies 1,000 miles, that's 100,000 seat miles, okay? You are you are transporting a seat from one location to another and um, the number of seats times the number of miles is going to give you basically the total capacity that you move to given distance, okay? So if you were to maybe say, um, 
move all the seats together a little bit, you can fit in another row. Then every every trip, that plane gets more seat miles on it. But the people who are on your airline aren't as happy because they're kind of crammed in more. So there's more seat miles is not necessarily good. It's good up to a point. But at a certain point, uh, people don't like this. And we're starting to lose business because um, we're really cramming them in like sardines. And they're, people are going to our competitor instead of us. So, so there's a balancing act. So then what's, what is the point of diminishing returns for this function? So we're basically going to do what we did in the previous example. Um, but we basically, um, I, I, I don't, um, I'm not going to get, my answers aren't intervals. My answer is, well, what's the FX coordinate where, where that occurs? So um, step one, I'll look for the first and second derivatives. So this will be three times 0.928. So let me get a calculator. 0.928 times 3, so I get uh, negative 2.784x squared, right? Plus 2 times 31.492, so I get 62.984x minus 326.8. Okay, now if I was trying to, say, find the maximum or something for this, or the minimum, well, then I would Go, go there. That's what I want. I want the derivative, right, to, to find local min max. But that's not what I want. I want diminishing returns. So I'm going to find the second derivative. Okay, so this will be um, negative, was it 5.58? It's not. I'm thinking I'm missing a 5. I'll just resort to the calculator. So 2 times 2.784. Yeah, 5.68. There we go. 5.568, rather. Okay, x. Plus 62.984. So now I can uh, see, well, where is this undefined or equal to zero? So R prime of X undefined, oops, of X. Well, um, nowhere, basically, because this is just a linear function. So no, not, not gonna have to worry about that. So look for where is this equal to zero? Okay, so I'll add 5.568x to both sides. And then divide by 5.568 on both sides. Okay, and I'll turn that into a decimal number, decimal approximation. So 62.984 divided by 5.568. And I get 11.312. Of course, I'm rounding a little bit. Okay. And the uh, X was in hundreds of billions of seat miles. So this is 11.300 billion seat miles. Oh, nice example there. So this corresponds to um, 100 billion. So this. In fact, let's do it here. So... Uh, one, three, one, two. So that's hundred and then billion. So seven zeros. I think I'm missing a zero. So let's let's check this out. So thousand million billion. 1100 yeah, yeah okay so that's that's in seat miles right seat miles so 1.1 trillion seat miles would be the point of diminishing returns and you know having more seat miles you will get more revenue but that'll slow down and maybe it's not worth it to do that maybe there's something else you can do to maximize your your income maximize to increase your revenue besides increasing seat miles, right? Like seat miles is one input to your overall revenue, but there are other inputs, right? Like, you know, um, wait times, um, the price, um, other features that, that, you know, like in-flight service of some kind, there's all kinds of things. It's just one thing that influences um, the revenue. So you might want to say, well, let's put seat miles at this and then consider raising it later if, if, we, if we need to. Here's what this really should look like at the end. I've got the uh, R double primes highlighted in yellow. 
And what I had been doing in this chapter is giving examples um, first, just running through the first example to find out, oh, what's how do you do this? And then give the procedure. I'm going to do things a little bit differently here because we've already done the first derivative test for local extrema. And the second derivative test for local extrema is similar. Um, of course, it's not the same, but it's similar. So let's kind of run through this. The beginning is is almost the same as the first derivative test, just but not quite. So this test is used for the exact same thing. This is for local extrema, okay? Um, but you're going to use the second derivative to do the testing part. Now, you still are looking for critical numbers because critical numbers are where you might get a local min-max. But once you find the critical numbers, you stop using the first derivative. First derivative. So given some function f, first find the first derivative. Okay, this is the same as for the first derivative test. <clears throat> for the first derivative test. So then we're going to find all the critical numbers that have tangent lines. So we're not going to look for where um, is the derivative undefined. Um, and the reason for that is because we need to later evaluate the second derivative at the critical numbers, that's simply not going to work. If the first derivative is not defined, the second derivative can't be defined either. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll remind you of that at, towards the end. The last point you can see at the bottom of the screen is the reason for that. So then we're going to solve, uh, in, I'm sorry, not then going to, but in order to find the critical numbers, we're going to solve this equation, 0 equals f prime of x. Then we're going to find the second derivative, okay, which... We could have done here in step one. We could have done one and three at the same time, but maybe it's better to do it um, down here rather than up there. Then for each critical number C, we're going to evaluate in the second derivative. If the second derivative is negative, then the graph is concave down, which means we have a local maximum. In this situation, the graph looks like this, right? Concave down, so there's a high point. If the second derivative evaluate, oh, I have a typo here. Well, not typo, but an error. You may have noticed these should be C's, not zeros. Whoops. Okay. Backing up a little bit. If f prime of C is negative, then f has a local maximum. If f prime of C is positive, then f has a local minimum. Again, for the, in the first case, if, if the graph is concave down, well, then it looks like this, high point. If the graph is concave up, the graph looks like this, low point. So it's a little counterintuitive that something being negative means you have a maximum. Well, yeah, but that's because the second derivative being negative means the graph is concave down. So there's a high point, therefore a maximum. Now, otherwise, uh, the test is inconclusive. So if either the first derivative is undefined and therefore you're not even going to get that critical number, then the second derivative would not be defined. Also, if the second derivative evaluation gets you a zero, the test is inconclusive. It doesn't tell you. You don't know at that point. So you would then have to go use the first derivative test instead. Um, some people might wonder, well, why would you even use this test if it does the same thing that the first derivative test does, finds local extrema, and a third of the time it doesn't even work, and you're not going to get all the critical numbers anyway? Well, um, this third possibility does not happen a third of the time. It's like maybe 2% of the time, something like that. So it's pretty uncommon. Um, and for some functions, the second derivative is easier to deal with than the first derivative. So you often would not use this test um, if, if your function was complicated enough that the second derivative, uh, that step three, finding the second derivative was a pain, well, then you wouldn't want to do this. But for functions where the second derivative is um, simpler than the first derivative, then maybe you would. So let's do an example like that. I think I've got one right here. Um, I don't think this is the same. Yeah, this is not the same as the very first example, but it's kind of similar looking. It's just a polynomial. For a polynomial, the second derivative test is often easier. So let's go through the steps. So step one, find the first derivative. So we'll get 8x cubed minus 3x squared minus 6x. Okay. Then we're going to look for the critical numbers. So we're going to look for where is this equal to zero? And um, I'll point out that um, since we're using um, this typically on polynomials for the second derivative test, well, the domain of a polynomial is all real numbers, so you would not be able to get a place where the first derivative is undefined anyway. So, so it works. So conveniently, the second derivative test works really well for polynomials. So then I can solve this equation and get uh, well, I'll factor out an x first. So this is x times. Ah, I have a mistake here. 
This is 3x squared. Okay, so I can factor out an x here. So I get 8, uh, x times 8x squared minus 3x minus 6. If I'm really lucky, this factors, but I, I kind of made these numbers up, so I don't know if this factors. Um, so I'm tracing the AC method. So 8 times negative 6 is negative 48. How does this factor? Does this factor, um, well, 3 and 16, that's not going to work. 4 and 12, that's not going to work. Uh, 6 and 8, that's not going to work. I'm looking for something that subtracts to make 3 or negative 3, and I'm not getting anything. So I'm probably going to have to use the quadratic formula um, for this. Okay, so I'll go ahead and separate these two factors. x equals 0, or 8x squared minus 3x minus 6 equals 0. So then uh, x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Okay, so uh, negative b would be 3 plus or minus the square root b squared, which would be 9. Minus 4 times negative 48 all over 2 times 8, which is 16. Uh, so 3 plus or minus 48 times 4. Is that 192? It is. And I'll I have a double negative. Negative 4 times negative 48. So positive 192 plus 9 is 201. So the square root of 201 over 16. Okay, so kind of um, messy. I'm going to go ahead and get decimal approximations for this. So 3 plus the square root of 201 over 16. So 1.074. And then 3 minus... root 201 over 16. Let's get negative point, uh, negative 0 0.699. Okay. So those are my three critical numbers. And so now step three is to find the second derivative. Okay. And that was from this guy. So 24x squared minus 6x minus 6. Okay. And step four, I think, was evaluate. Yeah, for each critical number, check the second derivative and see what you get. I don't really need to draw anything here. I can, but I don't need to because um, the concavity just directly tells you whether you get local min, local max. So if I do f double prime of 0, that was one of my critical numbers. Then I will get 0 minus 0 minus 6. That's negative. Oh, that means we have a local max at 0. Okay. Again, uh, that seems a little counterintuitive. A negative result means maximum. But remember, this is the concavity that's negative. So F double prime at, let's say, negative 0 0.699. Well, I'm probably going to have to use a calculator for this because it's kind of a messy number. So 24 times negative 0 0.699. I probably could safely round that to 0 0.7 or negative 0.7, I mean. Um, but if I'm having the calculator do it anyway, I might as well do this. Okay, is this positive or negative? So 24. And you could probably see the answer already. Um, if, if not, if you square 0 0.7 you're going to get a positive number times 24, which is kind of big compared to the other ones. So I'm pretty sure this first term is a large-ish positive number. A negative times a negative in the next term is positive. So you have a largest positive number plus something and then minus 6. I think we can see where this is going. But to be on the safe side, we'll have the calculator work that out. Yeah, I get about 9.92. So definitely positive, so local min.
at x equals. In fact, let's do this. I'm running out of room here. At x equals, and I'm going to use the exact value just in case. On say um the online homework, you might need to do that. Um, probably a decimal will be accepted for this kind of problem, but just to be on the safe side, we'll do that. Uh, so then uh, f double prime at 1.074, this is 24 times 1.074 squared minus 6 times 1.074 minus 6. So this one I'm not, I'm pretty sure it's going to be positive as well because that first number is going to be more than 24. So we get 24 times 1.074 squared minus 6 times 1.074 minus 6 and I get about 15.24 so definitely positive so we get um, local min at x equals 3 plus root 201 over 16 so there we go. We get one local uh, maximum and two local minima for that example. Anyway, those are some of the things we can do with the second derivative. Um, and then in the next video, we will look at some ways to use um, the concept of local min, local max to solve uh, more application problems. Basically, the next section is almost entirely application problems.